Battle of Langdemark was the second Anglo-French general attack during the Third Battle of Ypres, which was the major British offensive or Allied offensive during 1917. The French First Army had a big success on the northern flank from Bixhus to Dry Grattan, and the British overall gained a substantial amount of ground northwards from Langdemark to the boundary with the French, but in time a lot of that ground was subsequently lost. The weather prevented much of the British programme of air cooperation with the infantry, which made it easier for German reserves to assemble on the battlefield. An unusually amount, large amount of rain in August, poor drainage and lack of evaporation turned the ground into a, a morass, as you can see from this image of stretcher bearers. Um, this was worse for the British and French who occupied lower lying ground and attacked through areas that had been frequently and severely bombarded. So the bombardment leaving big craters combined with um, heavy um, rain, which wasn't able to drain away, just left the whole battlefield in a severely uh, difficult situation to, to get across. Um, rainstorms and the costly German defence success during the rest of August led the British to stop the offensive for three weeks. During the three-day battle, over 1,270 men from Irish infantry regiments lost their lives. This talk is mainly going to be, is going to be looking at the, the two Irish divisions that were involved in that battle. Um, the 16th and 36th divisions were part of 19 Army Corps and attacked from north of the Ypres Rulers Railway, just to the south of St. Julian. The divisions were to advance one mile up the Anzac and Zonenbeck spurs, provided, providing carrying parties since the last week in July and holding ground from 4th of August in the Hannebeck and Steenbeck valleys, which were overlooked by the Germans, had exhausted many men from the 1st to 15th August, bearing in mind neither division had been fully brought back up to strength after the Battle of Messines in June of 1917. Frequent reliefs during the unexpected delays caused by the rain spread the casualties and fatigue to all of the battalions in both divisions. The advance began on time and after a few hundred yards encountered German strong points, which were found not to have been destroyed by a series of special heavy artillery bombardments before the attack. So it was a combination of factors. Um, they weren't able to get the air support, the, the pre-advance um, artillery bombardment, hadn't been effective, the ground was bad, they were under strength, they were demoralized and as a result um, the battle from a perspective of the two Irish, two divisions raised in Ireland was quite frankly an unmitigated disaster. The 16th Irish Division suffered many casualties from the, from the Germans in Potsdam, Vampire and Borry Farms which I've highlighted on the screen. These had not been properly mopped up because of the acute infantry shortage. The garrisons were able to shoot at the advancing Irish troops of the 48th Brigade from behind and only isolated parties of British troops managed to reach their objectives. The 49th Brigade on the left was also held up at Borey Farm where several costly attacks were repulsed. The left of the brigade fared better, getting to within 400 yards of the top of Hill 37, which you can see just up here. Over 600 men from the 16th Irish Division lost their lives in the three-day battle. The Ulster Division um, suffered similarly. They struggled to advance with Gallipoli Farm and Somme Farms being found to be behind a new wire entanglement with German machine guns um, trained on gaps made by the British bombardment. The British artillery fire also stopped the advance of the 108th Brigade. To the north, the 109th Brigade had to get across the swamp astride the Steenbeek. In the absence of the artillery barrage, the brigade came under heavy, heavy and intense machine gun fire from Pond Farm and Border House, forcing them to take cover. On the left fr um, flank, troops got to Fortune, which was about 400 yards from the start line. Over 620 men from the Ulster Division died in the three-day battle. So you can see here on this map the starting line, the green line, the dotted green line and the red line. But the furthest advance was this red dotted line. 
So they, they made virtually no advance during the, the three days of the battle. So I'm going to move on now to, to talk as usual, as I usually do, about some of the men from Ulster who were involved in, in the battle. And I'm going to do it by county. And in each county, I'm going to pick up one man from the 16th Irish Division and one man from the 36th Ulster Division. Starting off with Charles McMaster, who was born on 28 September 1882 at Denmark Street in Belfast to John McMaster and Mary McVeigh. And they were living at Rose Lodge in the Bloomfield area by the end of the war. His father was a building contractor and his sons, Charles and Nendrick, worked in the family firm. Three streets in Ballymacarrit in Inner East Belfast were built by the McMasters and named after the family. McMaster Street after the, the family name, um, Lendrick Street after one of the sons and Susan Street after a daughter. Charles McMaster received a commission with the Royal Irish Rifles and was posted to the 7th Battalion, part of the 16th Irish Division, on the Western Front in January 1916. He was awarded the Military Cross in the 1917 New Year's Honours List for valuable services rendered in connections with military operations in the field. Whilst on a period of home leave, Charles McMaster married Maud Evelyn Kennedy on the 26th of January 1917 at Fitzroy Avenue Presbyterian Church. He was attached to Trench Mortar Battery when he was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 34. No known grave and is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial. Is also commemorated locally in several locations. Memorial tablets for North Presbyterian Church, Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, and the Central Presbyterian Association. He's also commemorated on the Strandtown and District Unionist Club War Memorial on the Belmont Road, and on this banner for Junior Loyal Orange Lodge Number 41, which was um, operating out of Ballymacarrett Orange Hall. Staying in County Down, James Wilson McBurney was born on 9th August 1898 at Moatville in the townland of Ballyrickard near Cumber. And his parents were Thomas McBurney and Anna Wilson who farmed land at Ballyrickard. James Wilson McBurney was educated at Belfast, Royal Belfast Academical Institution and joined the Queen's University um, Officers Training Corps in October 1914. In June 1915, at the age of 16 years and 10 months, he joined the 17th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles. He was posted to Drogheda during the Easter Rising in 1916, and then spent some time stationed at the Curragh Camp down in County Kildare. He finished his training at Fermoy in County Cork with the 7th Cadet Battalion and obtained his commission in September 1916. He was initially attached to the 20th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles and stationed at Newton Ards. He was posted to the 14th Battalion on the Western Front as a platoon commander in December 1916. Second Lieutenant McBurney was killed in action on 16th August 1917, one week after his 19th birthday. He has no known grave and is commemorated on the Tyne Cop Memorial as will be a lot of the men that I'll be talking about tonight. And he's also commemorated on this family plot in Cumber Cemetery. He's also commemorated on the QUB and RBAI memorials and the War Memorial Pulpit in First Cumber Presbyterian Church. His family commissioned a stained glass window from Cloakey, one of the major um, stained glass manufacturers in Belfast. And this was installed in Moatville in the family home at the front of the house. And it's probably the only stained glass window commemorating a war fatality that is in a private residence. The Congregational Roll of Honour for um, First Cumber records that Nan and Maggie McBurney served during the war, but I'm unsure as to the nature of their service. Also, Engineer Lieutenant Edward Wilson McBurney was serving with the Royal Navy Transport Service when he died on 2nd July 1919, aged 28. Moving across into County Armagh, Charles Cranston was born on 21st December 1881 in Loch Gaul to Charles Cranston who was an army pensioner 
and Mary Jane McQuaid, and they later lived at Derry Crew near Loch Gall. In 1901, Charles Cranston Jr. was working as a shipyard labourer and living at Lacca Street in the Victoria Ward in Belfast with his widowed sister and her two-year-old child. In 1911, he was a live-in servant, servant for the Lehman family who farmed at Annette Boy. Charles enlisted with the Royal Irish Fusiliers and was deployed to the 7th Battalion on the Western Front sometime after December 1915. Following the 16th Division's participation in the September phase of the 1916 Battles of the Somme, the 7th Battalion was amalgamated with the 8th Battalion in October 1916, forming the 7th-8th Battalion. Private Charles Cranston was killed in action on 17th August 1917, aged 35, and is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial. A war gratuity of eight pounds and 10 shillings, 459 pounds in current terms, was paid out in December 1919, with equal shares going to his four sisters. A pension of five shillings per week was paid to Lillian Cranston, one of his sisters, and that was from June 1918, for 52 weeks. Staying in County Armagh, Samuel Colbert was born on 7th November 1896 at Edward Street in Lurgan to Benjamin Colbert, who was a shoemaker, and Elizabeth McCoon, and they later lived at North Street in Lurgan. Samuel enlisted with the Royal Irish Fusiliers and was posted to the 9th Battalion on the Western Front after December 1915. He held the rank of sergeant in C Company when he was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 20. He has no known grave and is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial in Belgium and locally on the memorial in Shankill Parish Church in Lurgan. Um, this uh, war memorial takes the form of a cabinet whose doors open to reveal the names of the fatalities. There's the similar types of memorials elsewhere in Northern Ireland. One of them, Newington Presbyterian Church, was destroyed during the Second World War air raids. But there are similar um, styles of war memorial for both Petora Royal School, or what was Petora Royal School, in Enniskillen and in Foyle College in Londonderry. So it's quite unusual because when you look at it, you just see a cabinet. And it's only when you open the, the cabinet doors that all is revealed. In November 1919, Benjamin Colbert received a war gratuity of £16.10, shillings, £891 in current terms. A pension of three shillings and sixpence per week was paid to Samuel's mother, Elizabeth Colbert. Moving south into County Monaghan, William Armstrong was born on 16th June 1881 to William Armstrong and Margaret Wright, who farmed land at Emmyvale in North County Monaghan. His father was Church of Ireland, whilst William, his mother and his siblings were all classified as Roman Catholic. In 1901, he was a rural postman and he enlisted with the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. He was posted to the 7th Battalion on the Western Front after um, December 1915. He was awarded the Military Medal, um, with the notification being announced in the London Gazette in December 1916. The act of gallantry was probably awarded for acts during the battles of Ginchy and Guillemont in September 1916. Lance Corporal William Armstrong was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 36, and is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial. A war gratuity of £10, £540 in current terms, was split between four siblings and one sister, Jane, received a pension of five shillings per week. Staying in County Monaghan, Thomas William Dawson was born on 14th February 1897 to Samuel Dawson and Caroline Carlton, and they farmed land at Cormean near Clans. In 1910, Caroline was a widow with two adult children and two children under the age of 14. Thomas Dawson enlisted with the 10th Battalion Royal Irish Fusiliers, which was a reserve battalion for the Ulster Division. He was posted to the 9th Battalion on the Western Front after December 1915. 
Private Thomas Dawson was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 20, and is commemorated on the Tyne Cot Memorial. Caroline Dawson received a war gratuity of £8, which is £432 in current terms, in November 1919. She also received a pension of six shillings per week from April 1918. And this is one of the dependents' pension cards, which um, give quite a bit of detail. Charles Johnston Moore, having moved across into County Cavan, was born on 12th November 1890 to William Irvine Moore and Georgina Richards of Listarn Cottage, County Cavan. He was educated at the Royal School in Cavan and enlisted with the Royal Fusiliers, a London regiment. He was posted to 7th Battalion Royal Fusiliers on the Western Front in July 1916, but was serving with 7th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, which is part of the 16th, um, 16th Irish Division, when he was killed in action on 16th August 1917. He was 26 years old and is commemorated in, on the Tyne Cock Memorial. Georgina Moore received a war gratuity of £9, 486 in current terms, in December 1919. Richard John Sweetman Wolfe was born on 25th April 1896 at Gosford Domain in Market Hill, near Market Hill in South Armagh, to Richard John Wolfe, a gamekeeper, and Margaret McGrath. In 1911, the family was living at Keeper's Lodge at Cabra near Kingscourt in County Cavan. Richard was a private when he was deployed to France in October 1915 with the 9th Battalion Royal Irish Fusiliers. He was awarded the Military Medal with the notification being announced in the London Gazette in December 1916. As with the earlier case, the act of gallantry was probably um, awarded for acts during the Battle of Albert in July 1916. Sergeant Richard Wolfe was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 21. He is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial and this uh, memorial tablet um, was erected at King's Court Church of Ireland. His father received a war gratuity of 13 pounds and 10 shillings, 729 pounds in current terms, in November 1919, and his mother received a pension of seven shillings per week from March 1918. As you can see, the memorial is quite detailed. It has the cap badge at the top, but it also has his service number 18609 as well as his battalion number and his regiment. Moving into County Fermanagh, John Samuel Carruthers was born on 3rd February 1898 at Ferna near Tamla to George Graham Carruthers and Mary Jane Jemison. He was educated at Pretoria Royal School in Enniskillen and received his commission with the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers via the Inns of Court Officer Training Corps. He was posted to the 8th Battalion on the Western Front sometime after December 1915. He held the rank of 2nd Lieutenant when he was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 19. He is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial in Belgium and on the memorial tablets for Pretoria Royal School as displayed on the screen and Lisbelaw Presbyterian Church. Staying in County Fermanagh, John George Symington was born on 3rd February 1898 to William Symington and Charlotte Armstrong of Cool Cranel near Maguire's Bridge. John George Symington enlisted with the Royal and Skilling Fusiliers and was deployed to France in October 1915 with 11th Battalion, the Fermanagh and Donegal Battalion. He was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 19. Like so many others, he's commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial in Belgium, and he's also commemorated on the memorial tablet in Maguire's Bridge Church of Ireland. William Symington received a war gratuity of £10, £540 in current terms, in December 1919, and Charlotte Symington received a pension of six shillings per week. Moving north into County Tyrone, 
William Elliot was born on 1st December 1895 at Ballyfatten near Straban to Francis Elliot and Catherine Irvine. In 1911, the family was living at Main Street um, in Cyan Mills, and his father was a flax sorter and William was a labourer in a local spinning mill. He enlisted with the Royal Munster Fusiliers and was deployed to France in December 1915 with 8th Battalion. He was a Lance Corporal with 47th Company Machine Gun Corps, still within the uh, 16th Irish Division, when he was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 21. He's buried in the Anchory Wood Cemetery. Francis Elliot received a war gratuity of 11 pounds and 10 shillings, 621 pounds in current terms, in November 1919. Staying in the village of Sion Mills in County Tyrone, Samuel James Hamilton was born on 16th November 1891 to Henry Hamilton and Mary Livingston, and they lived at Albert Place in the village. In 1911, he was employed as a flax hackler and was a section leader in the Cyan Mills Company of the UVF. He enlisted with the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and was deployed to France in October 1915 with 9th Battalion. He died of wounds on 16th August 1917, aged 25, and is buried in the Brandhook New Military Cemetery. Mary Hamilton received a war gratuity of £14, £756 in current terms, in November 1919, and a pension of nine shillings and sixpence from October 1918. Moving west into County Donegal, Patrick McNamee was born on 31st December 1894 to John McNamee and Mary Callan, and they farmed land at Callan Corps near Stranorla. He enlisted with the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers and was posted to 8th Battalion on the Western Front after December 1915. Private Patrick McNamee um, died of wounds on 18th August 1917, the last day of the battle, and he was 21, 22 years old, and he too is buried in the Brandhook New Military Cemetery. His brother John was taken prisoner while serving with the East Yorkshire Regiment and died in a POW camp on the 5th of October 1918. John McNamee, the father, received a war gratuity of £14 for Patrick, in November 1919, and Mary McNamee, his mother, their mother, received a war gratuity of 19 pounds and 10 shillings for John in June 1920. The combined war gratuity of 33 pounds and 10 shillings would equate to 1,800 pounds in current terms. Staying in County Donegal, this is the Doherty family, and just look at the expression on. The, the mother in the middle there. Um, she definitely didn't like having her photograph taken. This photograph was published in the Belfast Evening Telegraph and its satellite papers in January 1915. Elizabeth Doherty in the middle of Century Hill near Letterkenny was the widow of Morris Doherty, a shoemaker. Three of her sons had already enlisted for war service and you can see them there in their uniforms. The youngest son, William, was too young to enlist but was undergoing preparatory training with the Letterkenny Company of the UVF. The newspaper article doesn't um, name, doesn't identify the names of the individual soldiers, but I know from other uh, newspaper photographs that the man sitting to the right-hand side of the mother, the man with the swagger stick, is uh, James Doherty. The other two I'm not sure of their names, but Daniel Doherty was serving with the 11th Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers when he was killed in action on 1st July 1916 and is commemorated on the Thiepville Memorial. John Doherty was serving with 1st um, Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers when he was killed in action on the 22nd of March 1917 and he's commemorated on the Pozier Memorial. This is James Doherty. And he was born on 27th April 1897 and enlisted with the Royal Inniskilling, Inniskilling Fusiliers. He was deployed to France in October 1915 with the 11th Battalion, Vermont and Donegal Battalion, and he was a corporal when he was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 20. He is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial 
and on the memorial window in Conwell Parish Church in Letterkenny. And his two brothers are also commemorated on that window. This is one of the windows which I spoke about a few weeks ago in the talk about war memorial windows. And this photograph was taken last week whilst I was holidaying up in County Tyrone, nipped across the border up to Conwell, took a couple of photographs. And when I did take them, I didn't realize that John Daniel and James Doherty were listed on that window as fatalities. Lizzie Doherty received a total war gratuity of £46, £2,484 in current terms in December 1919, and she also received a total pension of 15 shillings per week for the loss of her three sons. East into County Londonderry, Charles Egan was born on 18th November 1885 at Lockie in Forfarshire to Peter Egan, who was a stonemason, and Sarah Gallagher. In 1911, he was a labourer and living in Lanarkshire. He had served in France with the Highland Light Infantry and with the Scottish Rifles, and he was stationed at Everington Barracks when he married Sarah McIntyre of Donegal Place in Londonderry on May 1917 at St. Columns Roman Catholic Church. Charles Egan was serving with the 8th Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers when he was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 31, and he's commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial. Sarah Egan received a war gratuity of £16.10, £891 in current terms, in April 1919. It's not clear which regiment um, Charles Egan was serving with when he married Sarah McIntyre. The marriage register just records that he was a private and that he was stationed at um, or based at Everington Barracks. So it's quite probable that he had been wounded with um, the Scottish Rifles and he had been um, put on depot duties whilst he um, received, um, returned to full health. George Allen was born on 26th December 1894 at Bishop Street to William Allen, who was a dock labourer, and Rebecca Wallace, and they later lived at Fountain Street in the city. He was a general labourer when he enlisted with the um, Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, and he was posted to the 9th Battalion, which was already on the Western Front, and he was posted to them sometime after December 1915. Private George Allen was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 22, and is buried in Brandhook New Military Cemetery. His brother Robert had been killed in action on 1st July 1916 while serving with 10th Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. William Allen, the father, received a combined war gratuity of £13 and 11 shillings in November 1919 for the loss of two sons. That would equate to £734 in current terms. Moving east into the final county of Ulster, County Antrim. Nathaniel Dunlop was born on 19th February 1898 at Lone, near Cullibaki, to John Dunlop, who is a farmer, and Esther Boyd. Before the war, he was a carpenter and he was employed by a Mr. Herbinson of Cullibaki. On, on turning 18 in February 1916, he enlisted with the 20th Battalion of the Royal I Irish Rifles, which was a reserve battalion to the Ulster Division. However, when he was posted to um, active service. He was posted to the 7th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles, which was part of the 16th Irish Division. Rifleman Nathaniel Dunlop was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 19. He is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial and on the Roll of Honour for the Cullibaki United Free Church. He's also commemorated on this family memorial gravestone in the church graveyard for the Cullibaki um, United Free Church. The gravestone was erected following his father's death in 1942, and the inscription records, killed in action, France, July 1916. The inscription was probably included at the same time as the inscription for his father, John Dunlop, because the style looks very similar. And it would have been, um, put in, put on, certainly before his mother's inscription 
was added um, further down the headstone in 1947. Sarah Dunlop had received a war gratuity of six pounds, 324 pounds in current terms, in November 1919, and a pension of five shillings per week from March 1918. But I think this is an indication that even by 1942, there was the conception within what was then what is now North Ireland that if somebody served from a unionist community in the First World War and they died, that they probably died at the Somme in July 1916. So in this case, the information on the headstone bears the wrong country in which the in which um, Nathaniel died, but also the the wrong month and year. And the final case is Alexander Huey, who was born on 24th May 1895 at Ballymagashel near Stranocum to William Huey and Rose Orr, and they li um, later lived at Ballycraiga. In 1911, Alexander was a general live-in servant for the Mc McClure family who farmed land at Ballymagashel. He enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles and was deployed to France in October 1915 with 12th Battalion. He was killed in action on 16th August 1917, aged 22, and is commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial. His brother James Huey had been killed in action at Hooge on 25th September 1915, while serving with 2nd Battalion Royal Irish Rifles. Both are commemorated on the Stranocum War Memorial in North Antrim, which is visible on the screen. Rose Huey received a combined war gratuity of £13.10, shillings, £729 in current terms in November 1919, and the pension of 11 shillings and nine pence from March 1918. So there we have it, folks. Um, details on 18 men from Ulster, nine from the Ulster Division, nine from the Irish Division, who all died in a three-day battle in the summer, autumn of 1917. That brings the pr presentation to an end, and as usual, I'm happy to answer any questions. Nigel, thanks very much for that. That was very interesting. The maps at the very start was very good. Thank you. Yep, my thanks to Michael Nugent for the maps. That's good. Is he writes it? Does he write books about anything? Oh, he writes books about lots of things. <laughs> Did he do a book about? He's currently research. He is currently researching um, and writing a book on the Battle of Langmark from the position of the the 16th Irish and 36th Ulster divisions. So I've stolen a wee bit of his thunder, but that's good. Maybe, maybe we'll get him on to speak sometime. Um, the documents that you presented are always very good. It's amazing the the pension doc the the amount of detail in the pension documents. And yeah, they, go on. yeah, those dependent um, pensions cards are fantastic because they give you the actual amount of um, the weekly pension that was received, as well as the next of kin and the address. It can be very helpful indeed. Indeed, that combined with the metal index cards, the um, metal rolls, um, sometimes you can get uh, the uh, joining up the attestation documents and all. You know. Yeah, um, certainly the, the other major one would be to find out what battalion a man served with if his service records haven't survived. It's the metal, in, the metal rolls, the British War Medal rolls um, will give you that information. Um, one of the other documents which I use quite heavily for fatalities is the Register of Soldiers Effects, which again gives you the next of kin, but only the forename and the relationship. So it'll maybe say Father William or Mother Mary, um, rather than um, giving their full name. But it's great because it tells you how much they got as a war gratuity and when the payment was made. Yes, that now, register, I've noticed on that register, uh, the, the money is paid out at different times. Yes, it is. <laughs> Nearly always, it would never. They would. Um, no uh, war gratuities were paid out before the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, they were all paid out after June nineteen nineteen because that uh, that was technically the end of the Great War, certainly as far as the Western Front was concerned. Um, so that's where you start getting the war gratuities pay, being paid out. But they were paid out over a period of probably about six to eight nine months which is the usual government trying to delay things.
One other document I like is the, the wills. I mean, the people were, or the soldiers were made to write wills before, for instance, the Battle of the Somme, the very first one. Yeah, they would generally, if, if they hadn't already written a will, they would have written a will or had a will written for them and signed it um, in the days before a major engagement, their first major engagement. But once a will was written, unless something changed like the uh, next of kin had died, that would have remained. 